Welcome to the Safer Recruitment training video for parishes. This training video hopes to explain the Safer Recruitment process and requirements for parishes appointing volunteers or recruiting paid workers in the Diocese of Exeter. If you are responsible for the appointment of a volunteer, church officer or worker in your church, hopefully through this video you will better understand your role and responsibilities and the actions required from you to enable safer recruitment in line with Church of England guidance. This training video follows the guidelines of the Specialist Training Module S1 in line with the Church of England's National Training Framework. The Church of England and the Diocese of Exeter are firmly committed to the safeguarding of children and adults experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. It is important that you understand that your role is a vital part of fulfilling our collective commitment in the diocese and in your parish to take steps to protect wherever possible those who are vulnerable in our church communities. We are all striving to make our church a safer place for all to flourish. Safer recruitment practice is an essential part of the Church of England's approach to safeguarding. The adoption of safer recruitment practices and procedures is vital in trying to identify, deter and reject people unsuitable for working with children and vulnerable adults. Safer recruitment is more than just a DBS check. DBS stands for Disclosure and Barring Service and replaced the Criminal Records Bureau which was commonly referred to as CRB. The safer recruitment process must be followed for all appointments, volunteer or paid, where the role involves more than incidental contact with children or vulnerable adults, regardless of whether the role is eligible for an enhanced DBS check or not. As an example, a flower arranger would typically only have incidental contact. The flower ranger will likely say hello to people and possibly ask how they are, but so too would most members of the congregation, one would hope. Their role and subsequent interaction with children or vulnerable adults does not amount, therefore, to more than incidental contact. In contrast, a refreshments helper at a toddler group would have more than incidental contact. A trust relationship would likely develop between a child and a refreshments helper who is regularly providing them with drinks and snacks. This relationship could be exploited, so this is more than incidental contact. Incidental contact can be hard to define and an amount of common sense is required to interpret this for different roles within your church. But an analogy used by the Home Office is whether or not there would be more or less contact than the vulnerable person would experience through purchasing an item from a shopkeeper. As well as more than incidental contact with children and vulnerable adults, you must give consideration to roles of responsibility or trust in the church where an unsuitable applicant might use their standing in the church to facilitate offending. It is not common for harm or abuse to happen in a church building or at a church event. It is more often the case that an offender will use their position to network or win trust in order to perpetrate harm or abuse away from the church environment. You will therefore find that there are very few roles that justifiably won't need to follow the safer recruitment process. In the safer recruitment practice guidance, the House of Bishops have identified nine steps that are key to safer recruiting. In this training video, we are going to look at how these nine steps can be carried out in your local context. Be clear about who is responsible for appointments. Who has the authority to confirm or reject an appointment? In local churches, the legal responsibility for appointments and approval of paid officers and volunteers rests with the PCC. Responsibility can be delegated, but this person must have been recruited safely themselves, 
be capable, confident and trained in safer recruitment and be able to keep personal matters confidential. If responsibility is delegated, then the PCC must support that person and must not allow other parties to impart unfair pressure on the appointing person. The safety of the appointment is paramount. Volunteers can be hard to find, but the need to fill a role must not lead to safer recruitment processes being shortcut or ignored. Responsibility for appointing clergy and licensed or approved lay ministers normally rests with the bishop. If you have any questions around the safety of a clergy appointment, you should contact the diocesan safeguarding team or the bishop's office. You need to ensure that you have safeguarding policies in place in your parish, including a policy statement on the recruitment of ex-offenders Applicants for paid and volunteer positions must be clear about how they will be treated if they are ex-offenders, so you must check that your PCC has a safeguarding policy in place and that a statement about the organisation's commitment to safeguarding is included in all recruitment and selection materials. In the Diocese of Exeter, we have produced template policies that your parish can adopt to meet these requirements, so as to ease the burden of each parish having to produce these individually. These policy templates can be found on the Safeguarding Resources page in the Diocese of Exeter website. In considering the fair treatment of ex-offenders, Recruiters have to be aware of the legislation that governs what questions they can ask a person about their criminal record. To ask someone for information you are not legally entitled to know is in itself a criminal offence. So we will try to give some guidance here in what is a complex area. The Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 primarily exists to support the rehabilitation into employment of reformed offenders who have since stayed on the right side of the law. All cautions and convictions may eventually become spent or legally forgotten, with the exception of prison sentences or sentences of detention for young offenders where sentenced for over four years and all public protection sentences regardless of the length of sentence. The length of time before a caution or conviction is spent is determined by the sentence or disposal, not by the nature of the offence itself. For most purposes, the 1974 Act treats a rehabilitated person as if he or she had never committed or been charged with or prosecuted for or convicted of or sentenced for the offence and as such they are not required to declare their spent cautions or convictions. They would not have to declare spent convictions, for example, when applying for most jobs or insurance, some educational courses or for housing applications. The key message, if you are the person responsible for an appointment, therefore, is that all employers or recruiting organisations are entitled to ask and know about unspent convictions. It is unlawful though to take into account a spent conviction if the role is covered by the Act. The Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 was revised through the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act Exceptions Order 1975 to account for instances where it is in the public interest for recruiters to be able to ask about spent convictions. The entitlement to ask about spent convictions is dictated by multiple acts and regulations that identify activities, professions, places and other criteria such as regularity of contact and whether contact is supervised or not. These criteria differ between children and vulnerable adults so it can be a complex task to determine this entitlement. A general indication of entitlement is given in handout 2 
from the materials accompanying this training video. Roles that are covered by the exceptions order, and so are spent convictions that need to be declared, are referred to as exempt. If a role is exempt from the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, then it is also eligible for a standard or enhanced level DBS disclosure. For any role you are recruiting or appointing to, you are entitled to ask the question, do you have any unspent convictions? If the role, position or activity is exempt from the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, you can ask the following question to find out about their spent convictions. Do you have any convictions, cautions, reprimands or final warnings which are not protected as defined by the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 Exceptions Order 1975 as amended in 2013? If the role is exempt, then you are also able to request that they undertake an enhanced level DBS disclosure to verify any self-disclosure of spent convictions. In a limited number of roles, the eligibility may be for a standard rather than an enhanced level disclosure, but these are not common in the church context. As the same legislation governs the questions you can ask and the level of DBS disclosure you are legally eligible to request, you can use this correlation to guide your questioning by using the reference material for the DBS eligibility criteria. The correct level of DBS disclosure and the revealed information is determined by the nature of the role applied for. DBS eligibility is linked with multiple laws and can be very complex. There are gatekeepers at the Disclosure and Barring Service who prevent checks being requested that are not eligible. So we have to be clear on eligibility before requesting a check. To assist you with this eligibility question, there are several resources you can access. You can refer to the Safer Recruitment Practice Guidance document, which can be found on the Diocese of Exeter website. Appendix 7 outlines the activities with children or vulnerable adults that typically indicate eligibility. Interpreting this can still be complex, so in Appendix 8 you will find a list of roles typical to Anglican churches that will or won't be eligible for a DBS check and at what level. If you are responsible for an appointment, you can ask your local DBS verifier about the eligibility of a role as they may previously have determined the eligibility for this or a similar role. Another tool available to you is to consult the CCPAS Interactive Eligibility Tool, which is available through the CCPAS website using the link shown here. https colon forward slash forward slash interactive hyphen guide dot ccpas dot co dot uk forward slash hash symbol forward slash login. To access this tool, you will need to provide login details that prove you are entitled to use it through your Diocese of Exeter membership. The username is members area, which is all one word with no spaces. And the password is orange. If after trying these resources, you are still unsure, you can of course ask the diocesan safeguarding team. When considering the eligibility of a DBS check, you will see the term regulated activity used, sometimes abbreviated as just RA. This term relates back to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act exceptions order, where regulated activity is a category of activities performed with children or vulnerable adults that the Home Office recognise as being of a higher potential risk in nature than other forms of activity. 
The key reason for knowing about regulated activity is that it affects the level of DBS check you can request. For the most serious categories of offences, someone can be placed on what is called a barred list. There is a barred list that prohibits certain activity with children and a barred list that prohibits certain activity with vulnerable adults. If an applicant is going to be engaging in regulated activity as part of their role, then in addition to the enhanced DBS check, you can also re request a check of the barred list for the workforces they are going to be working with, i.e. child, adult or both workforces. To help you determine if someone's role will include regulated activity, there is a helpful flowchart available as shown here. This is handout 4 in the training materials accompanying this video. You will see that it contains a series of questions that can be answered yes or no to follow through to a general statement on whether the role would be considered as regulated activity and therefore what type of check is eligible. Here is a scenario to help you explore using the regulated activity flowchart. Tom volunteers for the church, visiting elderly people in their homes to help them feel less isolated. He often does the grocery shopping on their behalf. Using the flowchart on handout 4, see if you can determine whether Tom is in regulated activity or not. You may wish to pause the video at this point to give yourself time to follow the scenario through on the flowchart. After a short silence, we will resume with an explanation of the scenario outcome. Here is the answer to Tom's scenario, starting from the Start Here oval, top left on the flowchart. Tom volunteers for the church, so this is not a private arrangement, and we answer no. Tom's role does involve working with adults at risk, so we answer yes. Tom's role is not working directly with children, so we answer no. Tom's role is working directly with adults, so we say yes. As we read down the long list of activity that would count as regulated activity with adults, we get to the final parts that say assistance with cash, paying bills or shopping. Tom is helping with shopping and will be handling the money of these vulnerable adults as a result. This is regulated activity, therefore, so we say yes. The guidance given by the flowchart as a result is that the role does involve regulated activity and therefore it is eligible for an enhanced DBS check and is eligible for a check of the barred list. Hopefully you were able to follow that flow of questions through on the flowchart and you will now be able to use this tool to assess your own roles for involvement in regulated activity. To round off this section of the training on DBS eligibility and determining if we can ask about spent convictions, here are a couple of scenarios to work through. To do this, you will need Appendix 7 from the Safer Recruitment Practice Guidance, which you should find as a separate document as part of the training materials accompanying this video for ease of use. You can also use the regulated activity flowchart if you wish to. Here is the first scenario. Pat is a member of the church community and is also a coach driver. The church has organised an activity day for the youth in the parish and Pat has agreed to drive the group in his coach to and from the activity centre. 
Using Appendix 7 and the Regulated Activity Flowchart, see if you can determine whether Pat requires a DBS check or not, and if he does, whether he is in Regulated Activity or not. You may wish to pause the video at this point to give yourself time to work the scenario through. After a short silence, we will resume with an explanation of the scenario outcome. Here is the answer to Pat's scenario. If you refer to column A in Appendix 7, you will see that point 4 is driving a vehicle used to convey children, which is what Pat will be doing. So this could be deemed as regulated activity. At the top of column A, however, it outlines the frequency criteria that points 1 to 4 need to meet to be eligible for a check of the barred list. As Pat is only driving the coach as a one-off for this trip, the frequency criteria is not met and so we cannot request the barred list check for regulated activity. We are still able to request an enhanced DBS check however. When you refer to column B, you can see that point four in this column is work done infrequently, which if done frequently, would be regulated activity relating to children. As transporting children would be regulated activity if it were done frequently, this means that we have the eligibility to still request an enhanced DBS disclosure, and we can ask Pat about spent convictions. Here is the second scenario. Joy is on the rotor to give Holy Communion at church each week. Once a month, she takes the host to parish members who are sick or housebound. While visiting, she checks on their well-being and makes sure they are being seen by the relevant health and social care professionals. Using Appendix 7 and the Regulated Activity Flowchart, See if you can determine whether Joy requires a DBS check or not, and if she does, whether she's in regulated activity or not. You may wish to pause the video at this point to give yourself time to work the scenario through. After a short silence, we will resume with an explanation of the scenario outcome. Here is the answer to Joy's scenario. The act of giving Holy Communion is not an eligible activity for an enhanced DBS check, so we have no eligibility for the role Joy undertakes at church each week, nor for her delivery of Holy Communion each month to those who are housebound. Not being able to check someone like a Home Communion visitor who is going into vulnerable adults' homes often comes as a surprise to many people, but the types of activities that meet the eligibility criteria are quite restricted with regard to adults. If we look at what Joy does when she goes into people's homes, we could perhaps consider Joy in the role of pastoral visitor. She is delivering care advice and guidance when she is checking on their personal care and well-being. In Appendix 7, if you look at column B for adults, you will see that point 1C says Any form of training, teaching, instruction, assistance, advice or guidance. So this would potentially give eligibility for an enhanced check for this activity. At the top of column B for adults, however, it states that these activities have to meet the frequency criteria. As Joy is only visiting in people's homes once a month, she would not be eligible for an enhanced disclosure, and therefore we cannot ask her about spent convictions. A basic level disclosure could still be considered for unspent convictions. 
having considered what questions we can ask about an applicant's record and determining if we can request an enhanced DBS check or not, we come to the third step in the nine steps of safer recruitment. Every role, voluntary or paid, should have a clear role description. This should outline the roles and responsibilities that the applicant can be expected to undertake, including their safeguarding responsibilities in the role. When thinking about deterring unsuitable applicants, it is important to make it clear on the role description what checks or references will be required prior to appointment. You should have just deduced what level of DBS check this role might be eligible for, so make any requirement for a DBS check evident on the role description. Producing a role description for every role can sometimes be seen as overly bureaucratic and a lot of work to do for all of the volunteers in their different roles in the church. We appreciate the effort this could require and so to support you we have produced a raft of template role descriptions for the most common roles you might need to fill in your church. These can be found in the Safer Recruitment section on the Safeguarding Resources page of the Diocese of Exeter website. While many roles will be very similar between churches, we know that people operating under the same role title can be fulfilling different responsibilities. So feel free to tailor the general duties and responsibilities on the templates so they match with your local context. To that end, we have produced templates for the most common roles but cannot hope to cover every role for every church. So you will find a generic parish volunteer template that you can adapt to suit any other volunteer roles that you have locally. It is important wherever possible to advertise roles that you are looking to appoint to. As you will know from the C1 training module, one of the key principles of safeguarding in the church is promotion. By advertising roles and making it clear in those adverts that safer recruitment processes will be followed for the appointment, you will gain the twofold benefits of deterring unsuitable applicants while communicating to those coming into your church that this is a place where safeguarding is taken seriously and they can expect to be safe. If you are appointing a paid role, then it is important that you do advertise the role on the grounds of equality and diversity too. This avoids any question over the honesty and transparency of the decision-making process when someone is appointed if applications had clearly been open to all interested parties. Advertising also has the clear advantage that you may get more applicants than you had expected for a role. In an age where volunteers can be hard to find in many parishes, isn't it worth advertising in the hope that you get a better response than you had hoped for? The fourth step in the Safer Recruitment Guidance is preparing an application form. Application forms are mandatory for paid roles, but are recommended for volunteer roles too, so you can capture contact details, relevant skills and experience, and referee contact details. You should ensure that the organisation's application form complies with safer recruitment practice and doesn't ask about convictions or information you are not entitled to know about. To assist you, there is a template application form labelled Handout 7 in the training materials accompanying this video. The fifth safer recruitment step is taking up references. This is a key part of safer recruitment and is all the more important if a role is not eligible for an enhanced DBS check. For references to be as effective as possible, referees should be asked meaningful questions relating to the behaviour, conduct and attitude of the applicant with regard to children and or vulnerable adults. Simply asking for an open reference does not prompt the referees to consider the appropriateness of the applicant 
for the specific role they are applying for and does not help you with interviewing the applicant and making an appointment decision. An example reference request is available labelled Handout 8 in the training materials accompanying this video, which you can adapt to ask questions relevant to the specific role. Verbal references may be preferable to written references according to the circumstances and could be taken over the telephone or in person. These are as acceptable as written references and can often allow you to elicit more meaningful and relevant responses from a referee. If verbal references are taken, there must be a written record kept of the reference being received so that you have an audit trail if the appointment is ever challenged. A written record must be kept of the referee's name and position, noting whether this is an employment or personal reference, the date the reference was received, who the reference was received by, and the outcome of the reference. For confidentiality reasons, the outcome may simply be recorded as positive or negative for the purposes of record keeping. But if any negative points are raised by the referee, then these should be recorded separately and must be shown to those who will be making the appointment decision. Step 6 of the Safe Recruitment Guidance is completing a confidential declaration form. Confidential declarations must be completed if the role is eligible for an enhanced DBS check. Applicants cannot be asked to complete the form if they are not eligible. Applicants who are completing an enhanced DBS check have to be given the chance to self-disclose before any DBS disclosure is applied for. The applicant may realise in completing the form that the role they are applying for is one they are, that they are barred from or would not be suitable for them given their record. It also means that ex-offenders can be open about their record with recruiters so that their application can be received safely and handled in an appropriate and fair way. The confidential declaration form helps to identify any issues that might need resolving at an early stage. Having a disclosure is not necessarily a bar to working with children or adults who are experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. How a disclosure is assessed is discussed later in this training. Should the person responsible for the appointment have any queries over a self-disclosure, then the diocesan safeguarding team is available to give advice. If any information is disclosed by an applicant on their confidential declaration form, the diocesan safeguarding team must be contacted. Issues over relevance are to be discussed with the diocesan safeguarding advisor rather than any local prejudgments being made. Should the applicant to an enhanced DBS eligible role not wish to complete the confidential declaration, which is entirely their choice, the application must not proceed further and the application must be terminated. The seventh step is to interview all shortlisted applicants. For a paid role, a formal interview is appropriate so that a higher degree of rigour and questioning by multiple parties can be facilitated. For the majority of volunteer roles in the parish context, however, this could be excessive and likely to intimidate and scare off potential volunteers. For volunteer roles, therefore, consider having a discussion in a comfortable environment, perhaps with coffee after a service, for example. However the interview or discussion is facilitated, a written record must be kept of the interview. Questions regarding the general duties of the role will differ depending on the specific role. But for those where they involve work with children or vulnerable adults, 
you should ask direct questions that assess the applicant's suitability for working with vulnerable people. To assist you with this, there are suggested questions in handout 10 in the training materials accompanying this video. You may not be familiar with interviewing, or at least not for a role working with children or vulnerable adults. So there is a helpful resource to assist you in interpreting the responses of applicants during interview. This resource is labelled Handout 11 in the training materials accompanying this video. Step 8 is the consideration of approving the appointment of a candidate. The decision to appoint to voluntary or paid work must be made by those who have the responsibility for appointments. If responsibility has been delegated, then that person is the one who must be empowered to make the decision. There may be practical issues and resource pressures that would mean quicker appointment would be sought, but the safer recruitment process cannot be shortcut. If a responsible person is being pressured to appoint before the necessary checks have been completed, they should seek assistance from the parish safeguarding rep or the clergy to support them in maintaining the safe conduct of the appointment. Remember, you do not need to appoint. If none of the candidates meet the requirements of the post, then don't feel you need to appoint someone for the sake of it. This usually just leads to problems down the line if people do not have the right skills or attributes. It is better to provide unsuccessful applicants with constructive feedback and to re-advertise the role. Ensure that your preferred candidate is informed that the offer of employment or voluntary work is conditional upon receiving satisfactory information from all necessary checks. The start date or appointment must not be confirmed until the references and relevant DBS check are received and examined. DBS disclosures that are not clear must always be referred to the diocesan safeguarding team for advice. For paid roles, a contract should be drawn up and signed upon acceptance of the role, with both parties retaining a signed copy. For volunteers, a volunteer agreement should be drawn up and signed upon acceptance of the role, with both parties retaining a copy. In many volunteer roles, if the role description had been well thought through at the start of the process, then all the duties, responsibilities and guidance on acceptable behaviours and expectations from both parties would already be set out. So in such cases, it could be sufficient for both parties to sign a copy of the role description. Determining the eligibility for a DBS check for the role was covered earlier in this training and the level of check required should be clearly identified in the role description. With this information to hand, if the role is eligible, you need to contact your local DBS verifier to ask them to initiate a DBS check application with the proposed candidate. More detail about how the DBS application process works in the Diocese of Exeter can be found on the Diocesan website. If a candidate for a position that is eligible for a DBS check has lived or worked overseas for three months or more while over the age of 10, having lived in the UK previously or not, the person making the appointment should request an overseas record check. This is achieved by tasking the applicant with obtaining a Certificate of Good Conduct from the relevant Embassy, High Commission or Ministry of Justice. Guidance on how the applicant goes about this can be found on the gov.uk government website. To be clear, this means that in addition to the DBS check, the candidate must seek this additional check to cover the time they have spent abroad. When broaching overseas checks with a candidate, it is worth making them aware that this may incur a cost. Some embassies levy a small fee for the administrative overheads on the check, 
while some insist that the applicant attends the embassy in person, which typically means a trip to London. A few countries, notably the USA, require fingerprints to be taken and sent with the application. The taking and certifying of fingerprints at a police station in the UK costs in the region of £85 at the time of producing this video in July 2018. Whether the applicant is asked to foot these costs or if the PCC might offer some contribution towards the costs is down to the appointing church to decide. Any DBS disclosure certificate that has any information disclosed, be it soft intelligence information or convictions, must be referred to the diocesan safeguarding team for risk assessing. Some guidance may refer to such a DBS disclosure as blemished, but we prefer to describe them as a non-clear disclosure in the Diocese of Exeter. Non-clear comes across as much less judgmental when we need to be open and fair with ex-offenders. What has to be made clear is that the individual must not start in the role they have applied for until the diocesan safeguarding team has completed the risk assessment process and given their approval for the application to continue. When a DBS disclosure is not clear, the parish safeguarding rep or the clergy will need to see the original DBS disclosure certificate and send the details of the disclosure to the diocesan safeguarding team. In line with the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, and in accordance with the Diocese of Exeter's Recruitment of Ex-Offenders policy, the Diocesan Safeguarding Team will carry out a fair and balanced assessment of the disclosure and the individual to who it applies. A number of factors will be considered in assessment of the disclosure. Relevancy of the offence to the role to which they have applied. The nature and seriousness of the offence committed the length of time since the last disclosed offence, what the pattern of their offending was, their age at the time of their first and last offence. The circumstances of the offences is really key, which is why we always speak with the individual concerned to get their own account. Their attitude to the offence, both then and now. Their efforts to address past issues, to not subsequently re-offend and to make a change for the better? And finally, what changes there have been in their personal circumstances and consideration of what responsibilities they have successfully taken on since? The applicant should be assessed in relation to the nature of the role and tasks they will be expected to undertake. Consideration will be given to these questions. Will they have one-to-one -one contact with children or vulnerable people? Will they have direct contact with members of the public? Will they have direct responsibility for money or items of value? What level of supervision will they receive? Will the nature of the role present opportunities for re-offending? To ensure we have a good understanding of the role, and what will be expected of the candidate, we will liaise with the parish safeguarding rep and clergy as part of the process. When assessing a DBS disclosure or a self-disclosure made on a confidential declaration form, there are some key principles we endeavour to uphold. We try to apply a balanced, rational, common sense approach. The objective is not to further punish the applicant for their past actions. We will treat applicants on a case-by-case -case basis rather than stereotyping or generalising. To this end, we will always involve the applicant on a personal level rather than carrying out a paper exercise that doesn't show care or concern for the person involved. We consider real risks of harm rather than perceived risks. For example, imagine an applicant for a junior church helper role who had a conviction for falsely claiming benefits. 
We would challenge attitudes in a parish where they were automatically deemed untrustworthy because of this conviction. We may find that they had accidentally overclaimed on benefits for an unexpected change in circumstances and lack of awareness of their responsibilities to alert the authorities promptly. We would also consider how the children in their care might come to harm just because of this past conviction from 15 years earlier. The perceived risk of criminality by the PCC may not match the facts after scrutiny of the real situation. Consideration of the organisation's experience of ex-offenders also has to be factored in. Are there people equipped to manage this applicant given their offending history? Are there survivors in the church who we would need to consider? Are there other ex-offenders already in the church that might affect their rehabilitation? Maintaining confidentiality on a need-to-know basis. We will involve the clergy and the parish safeguarding rep in the assessment process and possibly inform the church wardens of the outcome as these roles will typically have a supervisory and observational brief where an ex-offender is present in the church. Any other persons with whom this knowledge was shared would depend on the role and how the post would be managed. All those to whom any information around the applicant's past is divulged will be told clearly that this information must be treated as confidential and that it must not be shared outside of those identified persons. You may be asking why you need to know about the assessment process and what it entails, but it is very important that those responsible for appointments have this information. Applicants who have a non-clear disclosure are often embarrassed or uncomfortable with other people knowing about their past and can be fearful about what will happen and how this information will be handled. So it is important that you know the details so you can provide them with reassurances at the outset. Conversely, it is important that you be able to provide your PCC and the rest of the church with the assurance that recruitment is being carried out in accordance with the law, that there is a robust process to assess the safety of any ex-offenders, and that there is justice in the way that ex-offenders are given a fair measure with a view to the ministry of forgiveness we hold from the gospel. Once all the necessary checks have been completed and appointment has been confirmed, we get to the ninth step of the safer recruitment process. It is good practice to induct new volunteers and staff, to ensure supervision and support is in place, and to conduct a review regularly as the role requires. The ongoing activities of induction, training, supervision and reviews can cause some consternation when parishes are appointing volunteers, as they appear to be very work-like. They are best practice for both paid and voluntary appointments though. With paid workers you must undertake them in a formal, structured manner to support the employee and ensure you are meeting all of your obligations as an employer. When appointing a volunteer role, please be pragmatic and undertake these activities in a way that is appropriate to the role and its level of responsibility. Induction and training, for example, are easily achieved by buddying up a volunteer with someone who is already doing the role or has experience of doing it in the past. This helps the volunteer to settle in as they have some ready guidance on what to do and someone they know they can turn to for answers to any questions or concerns that might arise. Paid workers should have a structured program worked out that ensures they are equipped to do their job safely and that facilitates their development. Supervision for a volunteer can be as simple as ensuring that activity or group leaders check at the end of each session that their volunteers are happy and have had an opportunity to raise any concerns. Effective supervision can also be incorporated into any meetings or planning sessions the team have 
so all the volunteers have a chance to share and listen and evolve safer working practices together. For volunteers and paid workers, it is important that they know who their supervisor or line manager is, so they know who to turn to with concerns. Reviews for volunteers do not have to be formal, and the regularity can be determined locally. You will know your teams and volunteers. They can be a relaxed conversation over coffee periodically, where the activity leader checks how the volunteer is getting on and gives them an opportunity to raise any concerns they may have. Paid workers should have scheduled reviews with their line manager. A formal probationary period is necessary for paid workers to ensure that they are suitable for the role and to support any additional development needs that may need to be met before their employment can be confirmed. For volunteers, trial periods are also advised as they are really supportive for the volunteer and for the activity leader. At the end of the trial period, the activity or group leader, perhaps with the support of a member of clergy if desired, should have an informal conversation with the volunteer. This gives both the volunteer and activity leader a chance to share any concerns and the volunteer has an identified opportunity to say if they're not happy and would rather not continue in the role. Finding volunteers can be difficult, we know. So supporting a volunteer like this means that even though they may choose not to carry on volunteering for this activity, because they have been supported this time, they are likely to volunteer for you again in the future for a role better suited to their gifts and talents. A volunteer left to burn out, who quits exhausted after six months, is very unlikely to volunteer for you or your church again. Activity, team or group leaders can find it difficult to broach the subject of any shortcomings in the volunteer, so having this defined trial period opportunity can support the activity leader in raising any issues with them that have arisen during this trial period. The opportunity to challenge behaviours in a constructive way here can help maintain the safe working and happiness of a team, as well as relieve any tensions in working relationships. Clergy or PCC support is recommended if any significant challenge is necessary or if the ending of a volunteer's participation is likely. Recruitment records must be kept securely and should only be kept for as long as you have a legitimate need for them. For unsuccessful candidates, this retention period should therefore not exceed six months. For successful candidates, information to be retained should be kept for 75 years from the time that their employment or appointment ceases. This is in line with the revisions under GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. Portability is the term employed for using a DBS disclosure obtained in one role for a new or different role. There is a facility for portability within the Church of England's Safer Recruitment Guidance. Anyone applying for a new role within the same diocese or cathedral does not require a second DBS check, i.e. their current check will be deemed portable, provided that certain conditions are met. Firstly, that the result of their current valid DBS check has been seen and is clear. Secondly, is the new role with the same workforce? So if their current check was for work with children only, and now they are applying for a role working with adults at risk, then their current check would not be portable. Lastly, is the new role eligible for the same or a lower level of DBS check as the previous role, i.e basic or enhanced, and with or without a check of the relevant barred lists. When will portability not apply within the Church of England? Portability will not apply 
and a new criminal record check will always be required in a number of circumstances. A DBS check from a person who is moving into a role in the Church of England from an organisation outside it cannot be accepted. For example, a volunteer with scope who wants to volunteer in the church or a youth worker employed by the local authority who applies for a role in the church cannot use their existing checks. New checks will always be required where an individual is seeking ordination, reader or lay ministry training or where a member of clergy is moving role. If a person changes jobs or roles and that takes them from one organisation in the church to another, e.g. moves to a new diocese or cathedral, then portability does not apply. The Diocese of Exeter do not accept update service checks, as there are some significant flaws in the system. It provides no audit trail to prove that the checks were carried out, which the CCPAS system readily offers for full checks, and the intelligence information on an update check is only updated every nine months, which is a risk period that we are not willing to accept. So, anyone requiring a DBS check for a church role should be undertaking a fresh DBS check using the diocesan CCPAS system. This may seem onerous, but it should re be remembered that checks for volunteers are free with the diocese footing the processing charges, and if volunteers have a full check through us, they can then register for the update service if other organisations they work with are willing to accept update checks. If you or other volunteers want to subscribe to the update service to use with other organisations' roles, they normally receive subscription details when they receive their new DBS certificate in the post. There is only a limited window of time after receiving their full check certificate in which they can sign up for the update service, which is currently 30 days from the issue date. So if they haven't had a recent full check, then they cannot subscribe until they have their next full check. The Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006, or SVGA, places a duty on an organisation to make a referral to the DBS in certain circumstances. This is to ensure that information is shared between organisations and to facilitate the consideration of barring unsuitable people from working in regulated activity. It aims to prevent unsuitable people from just moving from organisation to organisation, seeking out a weakness they can eventually exploit. Many past failings have stemmed from offenders being allowed to move on from an organisation without concerns being dealt with or shared, so the intent is to close off these gaps. The SVGA places a duty on organisations to make a referral to the DBS when an organisation has dismissed or removed a person from working or volunteering with children or vulnerable adults in regulated activity or would or may have removed such a person if the person had not left or resigned, where one of the following conditions is met. Firstly, if the person has been cautioned or convicted of a relevant offence, e.g. a serious sexual or violent offence. Secondly, if they have engaged in what is called relevant conduct, in relation to children and or vulnerable adults, i.e. an action or inaction or neglect that has harmed a child or vulnerable adult or put them at risk of harm. Thirdly, if the person has satisfied the harm test in relation to children and or vulnerable adults, i.e. there has been no relevant conduct but a risk of harm to a child or vulnerable adult still exists. The term relevant conduct refers to behaviour which endangers or is likely to endanger someone, 
conduct involving sexual material relating to children or involving sexual violence towards a person or inappropriate conduct of a sexual nature relating to children or vulnerable adults. In closing, here are a set of actions for you to consider as your next steps having completed this safer recruitment training. Have you read the Safer Recruitment Practice Guidance 2016? Do you know which roles in your team need to be safely recruited? Do you have role descriptions prepared? Do you know who your local DBS verifier is for your parish, team or mission community? Thank you for your time and effort in completing this safer recruitment training. To access further materials supporting safer recruitment, please visit the Safeguarding Resources webpage on the Diocese of Exeter website. If you cannot find an answer to your questions on the website, please do not hesitate to contact the Diocesan Safeguarding team.